Welcome to Online Church today. We're so glad that you can join us for church as we gather together. St. Martin's and St. Peter's are gathering as one. We're thankful to our great God for his kindness and mercy to us. We want to bring before God our prayers for those who are still suffering through the coronavirus. We particularly pray that the outbreaks in Melbourne and Victoria uh, would, be, would come under control. We pray for those places in the world where the uh, virus is still growing and people are still losing their lives. We want to pray for God to have mercy on our world, that we and all around us might see the great hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to thank you for joining us online today, whether you're local, whether you're a member of uh, one of our congregations, or whether you're joining us from around the world. It's great to welcome you here. We exist to make and mature disciples of Jesus. And we want to help you to connect to God and to us. We want to see you grow up in faith. We want to see you serving and using the gifts that God has given you for his glory that we might tell all the world of the good news of Jesus. This is what we do together. We've uh, begun our uh, Wednesday service at St Martin's, uh, 10 o'clock, and it's been a joy to be able to meet together and share in the Lord's Supper. And we've had some from the St Martin's Sunday 8 a.m. service joining there. It's been a terrific time of fellowship and growing in faith in the Lord. Next Sunday, we begin our 9 a.m. service at St Peter's East Linfield, our 10 a.m. service at St Martin's Calara, and our 6 p.m. young adult service at St Peter's East Linfield. Now I'm looking forward to those beginning and uh, seeing how it is that we might praise and honour God together, that we might hear his word and say our prayers, encouraging one another to go out in faith, hope and love. Psalm, Psalmist writes in Psalm 47, Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord Most High! the great king over all the earth. He subdued the nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob whom he loved. God ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our king. Sing praises, for God is the king of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham. For the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. Well, we'll sing praises to God in just a moment, but let me pray. Gracious God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you, that loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us sing God's praise.
morning and welcome to St Martin's and St Peter's online church this morning. This is De this is Amber. <laughs> My name is Alex Jovnak and I'm the Youth and Children's Minister at St Martin's. It's a pleasure to welcome you as we join together to praise and worship our amazing God. This morning Simon Manchester will continue sharing God's word in the series entitled Deep Faith in a Shallow World from the book of 2 Corinthians. And today's message is entitled Glory That Lasts and it comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 to 18. Now, like everyone, my family have had to adjust to life in a COVID-19 world. Before the virus, I would normally be in front of six to seven different groups of children each week in a whole range of settings, in a whole range of age groups. This included play group, primary and high school scripture, youth group, and kids' church. To all of a sudden go from that many face-to-face -face situations to zero, over the last four months has been pretty challenging. And my wife Alison, she's the deputy of a primary school, she's had her own challenges. Firstly, there was a challenge of coordinating online learning during lockdown, as well as the face-to-face -face teaching of the students who were still coming to school. And then, when the students returned, there was the challenge of organising every student in and out of the school when no parents were allowed on site. As well, both of my sons, they lost their jobs during the time as one was working in a gym and the other one in before and after school care because both those industries closed down during COVID. But amongst these challenges, God has been gracious and merciful to my family. It's been wonderful to have more family time together, sharing meals and having a chance just to hang out and talk through what's happening in our lives. And just in the last week, both of my boys are back working with my eldest Mitchell landing his first full-time position as a club manager at a gym in Chatswood. Praise God. I'm also excited that church is relaunching next Sunday so that we can reconnect face-to-face -face with our church family. I'm especially looking forward to meeting up with the kids in Kids Church. And I'm also looking forward to the return of both primary and high school scripture, youth group, and maybe even play group in term three. So, Things won't be like they were before, but that's not a bad thing, because I believe through the partnership between St Martin's and St Peter's that new and exciting opportunities are before us, one of which is the team's focus for diff different ministries, and I'm excited to be implementing this into Kids Church in Term 3. We have so much to be thankful to God for, so let's give thanks now to our loving Father, who sustains us in all situations. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your amazing power and work in our lives. Thank you for your goodness and for your blessings over us. We give thanks that you are able to bring hope through even the toughest of times, strengthening us for your purposes. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you that you are always with us and will never leave us. We praise you for all your goodness. You alone are worthy. Help us to remember to be thankful for your abundant blessings and provision. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Holy 
consumes like fire. What other power can raise the dead? What other name remains undefeated? Only a holy comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 7 to 18. Let's ask God to work in our hearts as we prepare to receive God's word this morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask you that you soften our hearts as we hear the message from your word this morning. We pray that you clear any distractions or lingering thoughts that we may have so that you can speak to us directly through the scriptures. And we ask that you give us ears that are willing to hear what you are saying to us this morning. Guide us through your word to draw closer to you. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 to 18. Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now, in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses read a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit and where the Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the, the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. It's good to be with you. Uh, my name again is Simon Manchester. And of all the messages which are coming at us at the moment, how good it is to take in God's word. So we'll pray a short prayer to begin. Gracious God, what we know not, we pray you would teach us. What we have not, we pray you would give to us. What we are not, we pray you would make us, for Jesus' sake. 
Amen. I read a story this week of a man who had been shipwrecked on a desert island all on his own. And as they were rescuing him, they noticed that he'd built three buildings. And they asked him what the three buildings were. And he said, well, the one over there is my house. Uh, The one next to it is the church. And the one next to it is the church that I left. Uh, We do, I think, have a sad, tragic ability, don't we, for tensions and divisions. And even Christians are perfectly capable of creating their share of divisions. The Apostle Paul felt this very deeply, and especially when a church turned against him, because if a church turned against him, it invariably turned against the truth of Christ. And this is the case that he's dealing with, with the Corinthian church, which we're looking at on these particular Sundays. Last week, I mentioned that some troublemakers seem to have come into the Corinthian church, and they're introducing some promises that have to do more with success and immediate success. And they're criticizing the Apostle Paul, therefore, for being unimpressive and for having answers that are just too far removed. And therefore, the Apostle Paul attacks their shallow faith, their superficial ideas. And he teaches again the great gospel ministry, which is deep and long and wide and high and eternal. Now, this uh, section of scripture we're looking at, 2 Corinthians 3 to 5, is extremely important uh, and vital You'll notice that our Western world thinks that Christianity is pretty unnecessary at the moment, and some even think it's unkind. But you'll notice that it also, in displacing Christianity, has put nothing in its place. It has no deep answers. The protests in the recent weeks have just created more tension, less cooperation. Uh, It strikes me that the sorry day, which is now 12 years back in 2008, has not really been heard or healed the wounds. Uh, People in our culture are trying to give themselves a lift in the best way they can by um, some activity or some humor or some substance. And then of course they just droop down again. And this is to say nothing of the great pit of death which is facing people and looms over almost everything we do. Uh, Whether people tragically die or eventually die A friend of mine died this week just talking on the phone, suddenly called away. And it's into this situation that 2 Corinthians 3 to 5 is absolutely vital. Now the text today is chapter 3, verses 7 to 18, which you had read for you. And I want to divide it into two points, two parts, and they go like this. The gospel is more wonderful than you think verses 7 to 11, and the gospel is more necessary than you think, verses 12 to 18. First of all, the gospel of Jesus is more wonderful than you think. If you read these five verses, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 7 to 11, you'll see the word glory comes 10 times. We talk about glorious news every now and again, Glorious news from the doctor, glorious news from the exams, glorious news if somebody finds a solution to the COVID-19 virus. And we say that the news of Christ is glorious news. It is glorious news and it makes everything else look ordinary. It reaches up to heaven and it reaches ahead into eternity. Some of you may remember hearing the gospel for the first time, and you may remember saying to yourself, this is the best news I've ever heard, and I'd be surprised if anything has ever taken its place. I assure you that there will also come a day where we will find ourselves, if we belong to Christ, sailing through the judgment. And at that point, we'll say to ourselves, the best news I ever heard was the news of Jesus Christ. Well, you see in chapter 3, verse 5, as we saw last week, that there is a verse that has to do with the letter, which is what the false teachers were preaching, something to do with the letter and the spirit, which the Apostle Paul was preaching. The troublemakers had brought something into the church, which is a kind of letter or regulation or responsibility, or duty, or perhaps we would say religion. 
Uh, if they were reviving interest in the Ten Commandments, it wasn't so that you'd keep the commandments to be saved, but they were putting an emphasis on the letter as if it was all there really is. In other words, the faith, the religion of the intruders is just an outward thing. Uh, this troublemaker, you see, uh, who comes into the church in Corinth or might come into your church, is not the sort of person who brings an extra in order to be saved. You know, you must be dot, 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 you must do dot, dot, dot in order to be saved. That's not what Paul is dealing with. Paul's dealing with somebody who's reduced everything to just mere externals, just formalities, just, we might say, good living. When I was a teacher at a school many, many years ago, the headmaster said to me when I told him I was going off to the ministry, he said, well, why don't you come back as a chaplain? But just don't go on, he said, with any of that born-again rubbish. In other words, don't tell us about a new life. Just give us some morals. And Paul, you see, in the battle with these intruders, is not fighting what we call works, He's fighting what we might call nominalism or surface, shallow religion. And so he contrasts the, the outward message of Mount Sinai with the inward message of Christ. And I want to ask you, as you've heard these verses read, which do you think was the most glorious, the day of Mount Sinai or the day the Apostle Paul walked into Corinth? Which was the most glorious message? Uh, if I could put it like this, if you could get into a time machine and go back to Mount Sinai and see and hear, and then get back in the time machine and go forward to the arrival of Paul in Corinth and see him come and preach the gospel, which was the most glorious? Now, of course, if you're looking for fireworks, the answer is Sinai. Lightning, thunder, the voice of God, the people calling out, stop, stop. But what do we see when we see the Apostle Paul walk into Corinth? We see a little man start to speak and speak about Jesus. And the Apostle Paul says, with no apology whatsoever, my visit to Corinth was more glorious than the day of Mount Sinai. Sinai was glorious. Yes, it was. But my visit to you was more glorious. Now, why does the Apostle Paul dare to say this? Well, the answer is in verses 7 to 11. And it's because the old covenant, that is the outward covenant, chapter 3, verse 7, brought death. It only brought conviction. It didn't bring rescue. Chapter 3, verse 9, it brought condemnation. Chapter 3, verse 11, it was temporary. It was not the final word. But the new covenant, the inward covenant, chapter 3, verse 8, brings the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. As soon as you put your faith in Jesus, suddenly God is your Father, Jesus is your Savior, the Holy Spirit is your indweller, exactly at the same time. And then chapter 3, verse 9, he says the new covenant brings righteousness, at peace with God, right with God, in God's good books. And then chapter 3, verse 11, he says, this is forever, it's eternal. So Paul is not criticizing the old covenant. Let me make that clear. God was not doing something unkind with the old covenant. No, it was the love of God to prepare his people with the old covenant for the coming of the Savior. Just as an x-ray would get you perhaps ready to see a doctor. So the old covenant had its role in preparing people for Jesus. And I think it's fair to say that the world that we live in can only deal with externals. The religious world, that is the non-Christian religious world, is really dealing with externals. There is no coming of the Holy Spirit. There is no peace with God. There is no eternal assurance. The religions of the world deal with externals. And the wisdom of the secular world deals with externals as well things that will ultimately just kill, condemn, and fail you. It's only Jesus who will bring to you the Holy Spirit, new life, make you right with God, ready for eternity. And the Apostle Paul is very clever in these verses because now the Corinthians have to choose. 
Is Paul talking the truth or is he talking rubbish? Uh, They have to ask themselves this question. Do we want outward stuff which did fail to bring life and hope? Or is it perfectly true that when the Apostle Paul walked into our city and preached in our city and we listened and believed that new life came to us and we received the Spirit of God, right with God, hope forever. So Paul, you see, is forcing them to make a decision and realize that he is speaking the truth. Now, friends, I want to just say to you again, just know for sure that the world, which is blind, cannot really get this. The the world only thinks in surface. And if you do ministry, whether you're a Sunday school teacher or a youth leader or you're running a Bible study or looking after your family or whatever you're doing, you need to know that it's the message of Jesus that brings life right with God and hope. Many years ago, the uh, Sydney Morning Herald had a writer for religious affairs, and she was really very anti-Christian. She didn't seem to understand Christianity. She never represented Christianity properly. And I wrote a letter into the Herald. It was a bit of a sarcastic letter, I must confess. And it basically said, look, why have you chosen somebody who doesn't understand Christianity who keeps attacking Christianity when you wouldn't choose somebody who's blind to do your art reporting and you wouldn't choose somebody who's deaf to do your music reporting. Well, within 24 hours, she rang me at my desk. She said, what's, what's your problem? You know, what don't you like about what I'm writing? And I said, if you don't mind me saying you don't have the faculties to really understand. You need to come to, to Christ to understand Christ. And if you'd like to have lunch, I'd be very happy to explain. Well, of course, she had no real interest. And we have to keep going with the ministry of Christ because uh, this is the ministry which is going to bring people a brand new life and get them ready for eternity. And if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, I want to assure you that you must this week lift up your head and say, I'm so thankful that in all the changes and all the difficulties, a brand new life has come to me. I am now at peace with God. He sees me as his friend and child, and I'm ready for the future. So that's the first thing. The gospel is more wonderful than you think, and than, than I think. Secondly, the gospel is more necessary than you think. Verses 12 to 18. Now, Paul says, as soon as you understand this, as soon as you see that the message of Jesus is what's going to change the heart and get people with God and for eternity, you become very bold. He says this in chapter 3, verse 12. We become very bold. We can't go to sleep at this point. Paul says, borrowing a moment in history, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, And his face was shining with the glory of God and he veiled his face to stop the Israelites from being afraid at the brightness. The Apostle Paul says he was not only veiling his face to save the Israelites from the brightness, but he was saving them from seeing the fading. Chapter 3, verse 13. He veiled his face, says Paul, so that they would not see what was a fading glory, an outward fading glory. So it was a double sadness when Paul uh, speaks of Moses coming down from Mount Sinai because Moses is veiling his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing something that's fearful but is passing. And Paul borrows this and he says in chapter 3 verse 14, do you understand that there is a veil, there's a cloth veil which Moses put over his face But everybody who listens to law, listens to old covenant, listens to religion, listens to letter, has a spiritual veil, a a kind of a blindness, and it's absolutely true. Earlier this year, I was at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, and I asked some of the Jewish young men what the grief was at the wall. What is the wailing at the wall for? And, you know, they were completely divided. They really had no idea between them what the wailing was for. The best they could come up with was that there was some wailing for the suffering of the past and the hope that there might be a better future. That's all they could really say. And I wonder whether you think a person today who's listening to the world give instructions 
or regulations or education or motivation or moralism, do you think any of that is going to bring life eternal? It won't. It's a veil. It doesn't open eyes or open hearts at all. But, says Paul in chapter 3, verse 14, in Christ, the veil goes and the life comes. Again, in chapter 3, verse 16, he says, when someone turns to the Lord, no veil, freedom. There's a great 3.16 for you. We often talk about John 3.16, God so loved the world. Here's a 2 Corinthians 3.16, turn to the Lord. That's the gospel. Turn to the Lord and there will be the lifting of the veil and the freedom and the giving of the Holy Spirit. So the apostle goes on to say uh, the experience for the Christian is not that we have a fading glory like Moses coming down from Mount Sinai, but because we've come to Christ, there is a brightening glory. It is as if the believer with a new life is being renewed, is renewed every day and on and on till the likeness of Christ. I hope, friends, as you consider this wonderful gospel, you will say to yourself again and again through the week, look for all the problems that I have and all the silly thoughts that come to my head and all the challenges in front of me. In my heart, the new life through Christ. As I lift up to God in heaven, he has taken the barrier away and sees me as a beloved child. And as I look forward, that death is just a door through to glory. In, up, on. The gospel is absolutely wonderful and necessary. I wonder whether this message has become a little stale for you. And I wonder why it's become stale for you. As I reflect on my own heart and life, I think that it's often because it's the divided heart which makes me stale. I lose the joy of fellowship with Christ because of this compromising life. Or is it that there has been lots of shallow attention to the Word of God, but lots of concentrated attention to television and things that are not that important? If you're in a desert time in your spiritual life, it can be a very wonderful time because it can make you more thirsty for Christ, to seek him more carefully, more faithfully, more joyfully, and to cause your faith to get keener. Well, this is really the message of 1 Corinthians 3 this morning, and I hope you'll remember these two things. Number one, the gospel is more wonderful than we think it is. Number two, the gospel is more necessary than we think it is. In my paper this week, I read of somebody called Steve Bing, who had apparently $600 million to his name. He had his own jet, he had all the prettiest girls in the world, and yet it's only a couple of weeks ago that he took himself to the veranda of his 27th floor of the hotel that he was living in and jumped to his death. Everything the world could possibly offer, all the surface things, but nothing inside, no peace with God, no future. It seems that he was desperate. And this gospel message, which we have been privileged to hear, is more wonderful and more necessary than anything we can possibly offer to the world. Let's bow our heads and pray. We thank you, our gracious God, for bringing to our ears this wonderful message of Christ, to turn to Christ. We thank you for the gift of your spirit, new life, the gift of righteousness, of being right with you, and of eternity, a future, a hope, forever. We ask that you would help us to appreciate this and we ask that you would help us to communicate this in the way we live and speak. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
So we come to a time of prayer. The Apostle Paul writes in Philippians 1, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Let us pray. God, our Father, thank you for rescuing us from the dominion of darkness and bringing us into the kingdom of Jesus, the Son you love. In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Hear our prayer for all who are far, far, far away from you, enemies in their mind because of their evil behaviour, that they might come to believe the hope that you hold out in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Please, Lord, open doors for the gospel in every land. Please, Lord, open doors for the gospel in our local community. Please enable the messengers of your truth to proclaim it clearly as they should. Please be with each of us that you might use us in your gospel. Help us to be wise in the way we act toward outsiders and to make the most of every opportunity you give us. May our conversation be always full of grace and seasoned with salt, that we may know how to answer everyone. Look in mercy, our Lord, on those who at this time are struggling. We particularly pray for those in this pandemic who have lost loved ones, who are facing illness. Great God and Heavenly Father, please come powerfully to our nation in these dark and difficult days. Please slow the spread of the virus throughout our land and please protect the vulnerable from its deadly touch. We thank you for the way that you have spared us in many ways here in Australia. Please comfort the families, though, of those who've died from this disease, fill their hearts with presence and gather around them friends, family and neighbours who will comfort and support them in their time of loss. We're so thankful, Lord, for the gift of modern medicine, for the passion and dedication of medical staff everywhere. And we pray for each and every one, including those in our congregations, that you might protect and sustain them and give them the strength, energy and courage that they need to carry on. Please, Lord, guide the minds of the leaders in our nation in the decisions that they are making which will affect all of our lives. We particularly bring before you our Prime Minister Scott Morrison and our Premier Gladys Berejiklian. Please lead them to act wisely, carefully and in the best interests of all Australians. Please shine your light on the path ahead. And please draw close to the anxious hearts, the troubled minds of those who are facing financial stress. Please protect them and their families from long-term economic damage and guide them day by day, step by step, through the crisis. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give to each one of us a calmness and a wisdom that we might carry on together through the days, the weeks and months ahead. We thank you so much for the blessing of beginning to be able to gather together in person. Heavenly Father, may we not take that for granted. We pray that you might not only gather us, but gather many from our community to hear your word in the weeks and months ahead, that we might turn to you, put our faith and trust in you, and find hope and comfort in the Lord Jesus Christ. Give us a boldness and a courage, a deep humility and understanding of just how much you love us, of what you've saved us from and what you've saved us for. Please bring great good out of this evil, this terrible crisis. Please remind each of us that we don't need to make the journey of life on our own, in our own strength, but that you are here as close to us as our own breath to fill our hearts with your love. Please, Lord, surround us with your powerful, protective arms and guide us in your path. We ask all these things for this country, for your people, all of us gathered here online. 
Lord, you've given us grace to agree in these prayers, and you've promised that when two or three ask together in your name, you'll grant their requests. Fulfill now, Lord, our desires and prayers as may be best for us. Grant us in this life a knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life eternal. Amen. Hey friends, it's Sam Crisp here with CMS in Taiwan, and I'm actually standing on our balcony at the moment. I thought I'd give you a quick look at our neighborhood. We live on the outskirts of the city, and so there's a bit of abandoned, not yet used ground here, and off in the distance you can see some of the local mountains, which is lovely. Uh, I also wanted to show you this pot plant of ours. Uh, we like uh, trying to grow things on our balcony, and this particular plant here is one of the most common local vegetables in Taiwan. It's actually sweet potato leaves. You can cut them off and stir fry them with garlic, and it's very tasty. This plant was grown by Shan Shan from scratch, and in our latest newsletter, you can read a reflection from her about what the process of growing this plant has taught her about our journey as missionaries and gospel fellowship. Uh, so do check that out. This month, we are continuing to learn uh, studying culture and language. We've recently done a cultural learning project looking at fortune telling in Taiwan, which is very interesting. Uh, we might share more about that another time. I'm continuing to study Chinese uh, and sharing and learning Bible stories each week with my non-Christian Chinese teacher, which is really exciting. Uh, this month is also the last month for the CMS Lasting Hope Appeal. Hopefully you've heard about that already. Uh, this year, CMS needs to raise around 1.6 million to continue supporting all of their existing missionaries and to be sending new ones out. Uh, we're really thankful for all of you who give uh, already regularly to support us and our family here, is, here in Taiwan. Uh, at the moment, we're at about 75% of our total support level. And so the way that CMS fills the gap for us in our support level and all of their other missionaries is through the Lasting Hope Appeal. Now we know that at the moment, for many of you, in light of coronavirus, finances are a bit more uncertain. Uh, but if you are able, uh, please consider whether you might be able to make a one-off donation to the CMS Lasting Hope Appeal uh, to support us and support CMS as they send out more missionaries, uh, all with the goal of seeing a world that knows Jesus. Thanks again for all of your support and prayers, and I'll see you next time. Thank you again for joining us for Online Church. I'm really looking forward to joining with many of you in person next Sunday at 9am at St. Peter's, at 10am at St. Martin's, and 6pm at St. Peter's, as well as, of course, our Wednesday communion service at St. Martin's, Kalara. These are very exciting uh, uh, prospects uh, to be able to gather again together. Our online church will be continuing for those who are not yet able to join us yet. Uh, and so uh, we're praying that all the technology goes well for all of that. Um, please do pray for Simon Manchester as he continues to bring us God's word from 2 Corinthians chapters 3 to 5. What a blessing it is to have him bring God's word to us. And please do take the time to think through what God is saying to you in his word today and during the week. And I know many of the growth groups are looking at the Bible study questions that Simon Manchester has, uh, has prepared for us as well. And I pray that that's a great blessing to you and your groups this week. I hope you're able to catch up over Zoom uh, after the service today to encourage one another in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, thank you also, just as we conclude, for all those who are able to give and support the, uh, the work of Anglicare by bringing uh, food and, uh, and other goods uh, yesterday to our churches at St. Martin's and at St. Peter's. Uh, what a blessing to receive these and we will, um, be, they'll be collected this week and they'll go to Anglicare and help support those who are in deep need at this time. Thank you very much for your generosity. Well, as we conclude, let me pray. Gracious, gracious God, you made an eternal covenant with us through the blood of your son and brought him back from the dead as the great shepherd of your sheep. 
Equip us with everything good for doing your will. Work in us what is pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Hebrews 12 says, Since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so serve God in a way that is pleasing to him with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Amen.